this evening to hear some ideas that I think are significant to these industries, capital and construction projects. Uh, fields that have had issues for many, many years to deliver just on time, in full, on budget. And here am I claiming that there are ways to deliver, not just on time, but in less time. Not just on budget, but in less time. And without compromising on scope, quality and risk. So we no longer have to trade off. Um, so thanks for coming along to hear what that's about. Before we get started, I'd like you all... Does anybody know who Barry Marshall is? <laughs> Barry Marshall. No. He's an Australian who won a Nobel Prize in about 1990, 1989. Uh, he discovered what caused ulcers. However, for about 20 to 25 years before then, he was, in effect, ostracised by the medical profession because he was not saying what the party line is. What I would ask you this evening is, whatever your current views, now see if for 30 minutes you could just put those to one side and think about what I'm suggesting on its merits. Because it certainly is not how most of you will have been trained to manage projects. So, what are we talking about? Uh, maybe some of you aren't even <coughs> sure that there's a problem today with capital projects. Uh, I spent the early part of my career as a project manager not realising that most projects go wrong. And I'm sure some of you will be in the same position. Uh, but we gathered some data from some of the major global management consultancies in the past few years who looked at a range of significant capital mega projects in a range of industries from oil and gas, mining, public sector infrastructure, a mix of private and public sectors. The conclusions are quite striking and scary. The majority of projects don't hit their time budgets, don't hit their cost budgets. And if the best of the best in the world today can't do it, <coughs> yeah, who am I to say that there's a better way? Hopefully I'll introduce that this evening. At a micro level, so at a macro level, we know that most projects don't come in on time, don't come in on budget. And many of them still have to compromise on scope. But also, at a micro level, there are also significant range of problems on projects. Any of you involved in projects just need to spend a few minutes talking to your colleagues and all sorts of things will come out. The problem is which one of those do we solve, do we tackle, do we think is representative of, of whatever it is causing the problems? Uh, is it to do with team spirit? Do we need more leadership? Is it to do with the suppliers that we've got, either getting better suppliers or contracting with them differently? Yeah. Is it because we take so much time sorting the contracts and commercials out? Who knows? But there are many, many symptoms that there is a problem. Another feature of projects, of course, is they've not been done before. They're going into totally new territories. They're exploring new chartered waters. Yes, buildings have been built, but never in exactly the same place, to the same standard, with the same team, with the same climatic weather conditions. There's all sorts of unknowns on major projects. The team together is also exploring new territories. It's very rare that the team has worked together before. And building a new team takes time and effort. And many projects just haven't got the time available to, to spend years getting to know each other and our own little nuances. There are as many different ways of running a project and many different sources of advice as there are projects almost. So what the heck do we do? Trust is an issue. <coughs> We all know instinctively that teams need trust. You don't need to spend long in the presence of people involved in capital and construction projects to realise that there is not significant amount of trust, even amongst team measures on a project. And oh, there are many, many tools and techniques that can be used. And I'm going to claim that many of the techniques are not suitable for purpose. A screwdriver is a great tool. It's got many brilliant purposes, but putting nails in isn't one of them. So that's, that's, that's a little bit about uh, what we're planning to talk about on projects. 
Is it the people? So projects are not successful. Projects use people. Surely, if we just get the right people on board and get them to work better, projects will be successful. The only problem is that's been tried for many, many years on many, many occasions. Is it just a case of getting a bit more training? Is it just a case of choosing a different supplier next time? History has told us that that also is not the uh, source of a reliable, sustainable improvement to your project processes. Sure, changing some individuals will help, changing some suppliers will help, but all of a sudden it could degrade again. Uh, I remember talking to uh, a guy responsible for projects at a multi-billion dollar turnover software company about 18 months ago. Uh, and he's, they've, they've recently implemented one of the, uh, the pillars, as we call them, of breakthrough project management to great success. But one of the things he tells me is that 18 months before, they embarked on a significant training and qualification program for their project managers, putting them through uh, probably the most well-known structured training program that's available in the world today for project managers, uh, let their projects run for six, nine, 12 months afterwards, and they saw no noticeable change in any of their key performance indicators for projects. After in implementing one of the key methods that we recommend, within six months, the board had noticed a change. One of their key measures of performance was how many of their projects did the board have to get involved in to apologise to clients because they were late or they were going over budget. <coughs> within six months, the board thought something was wrong with their mobile phones because they were just not being rung anywhere near as often. But that is about... They had the same people. They had exactly the same people doing the same projects. The only thing that they changed was the, the methods and the techniques that the people use. And that's what we're going to talk about. But you could argue, well, project management is well defined. There's a great uh, three centimetre thick project management institute body of knowledge. Surely if we just implement that... Well, no, people are doing that today. People are implementing methodologies, whether it's PMI, PRINCE2, whoever's methodology you want. But there's still inconsistent results. There's no close correlation bet between using a particular methodology and project success. My premise is that the heart of the problems we've got with projects are three core areas. How we plan how we contract, and how we manage our execution. And those are the three uh, areas that I'm just going to talk about for the next 15 minutes, and then open it up for argument, disagreement, and questions. The exciting, the fun bit of this evening. <coughs> in, the, in the book that uh, I wrote with Robert Bolton, uh, and we published just last month, uh, we believe we found some sustainable, easy, repeatable ways for overcoming those issues. Focusing on contract, our contract and selection process forms what we've called a true team. Not just a group of people who happen to be working on the same projects, but a team who look out for each other and are rewarded for looking out for each other, rather than rewarded for beating, cheating, sneaking, or just what, whatever you can get away with. So that will establish a collaborative project team. But I want to exploit that collaborative project team. I don't just want to assume that because people get on with each other, that will automatically deliver better project results, because that won't happen. That's also naive. It might do, it might not do. That's not management, that's hope. Uh, so the, the final area is about the method we use to manage to plan our projects, to manage execution and control project process. Okay, the first of those, how we plan and manage execution. Uh, this slide's aimed at highlighting uh, some of the, what I think are significant changes. Moving away from things like fixed prices and deadlines to ranges and best efforts. So by a range, I mean... That contract is not 5 million euros, 
it's somewhere between four and seven million. That structure will not take eight months to put up. It'll take somewhere between six and nine months. Now, these are the sort of behaviours that we will all use in our day-to-day -day lives. Except when we come into the office as a project manager, we put them to one side and we say, no, no, the best way to manage a project team is with fixed deadlines. Even though we know that it's a guess and we're playing a game. Uh, the focus today is on the plan. Get the plan right, plan down to detail, get 15,000 tasks in there, all logically linked, and then we can relax. No, we're saying focus on a good enough plan, but then have flexible, fast feedback execution methods that tell you when you're going in the right direction and help you adjust quickly if you're going in the wrong direction. None of us would plan a long journey a 12-hour car journey and say at exactly 15 minutes past three in the afternoon I will go through the green traffic light in the middle of that town. We would think that's stupid. But if we're managing a major project with 20,000 tasks that's almost exactly what we're doing. <clears throat> Monthly reports are almost the norm. No idea why a month, why not three weeks, why not five, although some projects do four weekly but why should we report on our project just because the moon has gone through one phase of its cycle? No reason. And you certainly can't get good feedback and good control. It's like driving the car and only looking what's happening. Am I, th am I where I should be? No. You look continually and you want continual feedback. And that's what we're recommending we get in projects. There's a heavy focus on cost because money is important. We know that. However, the cost of a project is the result of what people do. So focusing on cost is just like driving the car by looking in the rear view mirror. It just shows us what's happened. If you want to drive a car, you look ahead. If you want to drive a project, focus the resources, make sure the tasks flow, and then the cost will be minimised. But looking at cost doesn't change a thing. And <coughs> currently... Projects like to start as soon as possible. As soon as possible. Project clients like to see something happen. People being busy. Stuff arriving on site. Contractors like stuff on site as well because they can get paid. That's another conflicting tension. However, we're going to recommend start as late as possible. Not too late, but start no sooner than you need to. Now... To many of us experience on projects, this sounds like a recipe for disaster. No detailed plans, no hard focus on cost. Surely things will spiral out of control. Well, here's one <coughs> company that doesn't believe so. Here's a few others. All of them major global players whose projects are a significant scale, all of whom have started... 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, Seagate was over 20 years ago in new product development. The Japanese Ministry of Land Infrastructure and Transport was about the mid-2000s, 12 years ago. All started deploying a method that embeds the green checklist on the right, the things that are almost the opposite of what many construction projects do today. And they've seen these sorts of benefits. The resources can do a third more projects without overtime, without stress. Projects are taking significantly less long. And, no, it's like a perpetual motion machine. Projects are shorter, but more of the projects arrive on time. So how are they doing it? Uh, the, the principles kept, were published in a book in the late 1990s by a guy called uh, Ellie Goldratt. And it introduced the idea of what's become known as CCPM, Critical Chain Project Management. Which, on the one hand, you could say it codifies, it formalises what a number of experienced project managers know to do anyway. <coughs> that in itself is not a bad thing, because all of a sudden it makes experience trainable and manageable. You don't need 25 years worth of experience to become a reasonable project manager anymore. 
you can avoid most of those problems using a methodology. Uh, it's systemic, which means it focuses on the end-to-end -end overall project. It doesn't assume you make a project better by focusing on each individual task. And it's got many differences in focus from the more commonly known critical path method that I've just highlighted on the previous screen. Uh, I'm only going to talk about one of those in this short presentation, and it's the idea of what are known as buffers. Now, in order to explain what the heck a buffer is, uh, I'm going to use a very, very simplified um, project program, Gantt chart, series of activities. Uh, and here we've divided each of the activities into two areas. Now, if I was to ask any of you how long it will take you to get home this evening, you'd give me a range. You'd give me a range. And if you wanted to be very certain, you'd give me a very certain date. How long would that be? Yeah, 50 minutes? 50 minutes. On average, how long does it take you? 20. 20. So 20 to 50. Traditionally in projects, we want 50 minutes. We want to be certain. Critical chain takes the opposite effect. It says, give me the 20. So that's what we've shown here. 20 minutes is our average time. 50 minutes is the safe time. And every task has it in. It's not always 50-50, but this is just a simplified diagram. So any task estimate might be done faster, but it's fairly certain it can be done within that time. Now, what the approach for critical chain does is it takes these task durations, <coughs> removes all the safety and pops it over the other side in a bucket, shuffles your project back together again, uh, takes the safety out of the bucket, adds it to the end of the project. That by itself would not make an awful lot of benefit, except for the mathematics of the aggregation of risk. Now, without going into the details, if this is project safety, you need a lot less than managing indiv individual tasks separately. Uh, the, it's the model of the insurance industry. It's why we each pay a much smaller insurance premium than the amount of money we would have to put aside if we had to cover the cost ourselves. The risk is aggregated, so we all have to put a little less in. And that's what actually happens on projects managed with critical chain. This amount of safety time that we've just taken out of individual tasks needs to be less. And that's something known as a project buffer. It's a contingency for whichever task needs it. So all we've done is we've moved each, <coughs> each individual task used to protect itself from uncertainty with its own safety allowance. It makes sense. We've now said, let's make that a project time contingency and we'll give it to whoever needs it. Of course, as we know, it's very unlikely that every task is going to have big problems. Some will have a problem, some it will go more easily. So that's why we need a bit less at the project buffer. Uh, the methodology puts a few other bits of safety in, uh, the significance of which I'll show on the next slide. So here's the headline. That same project, same number of tasks, now has a completion date that will be some 25-30% shorter than it would otherwise have been. At this stage, it looks like, well, that's just playing with numbers. That's exactly the same that the CFO does when I give him a budget recommendation. He cuts it. Well, as I said, there's a lot more to critical chain than that. But that is fundamentally how project programmes are set with a much shorter deadline. There's much more in the method that means projects hit that deadline very, very frequently. But either unfortunately or fortunately, we've not got time in to go into that level of detail this evening. You can read a little bit about it in this book, but again, we've not gone into the full explanation of using critical chain in detail. There's a number of great references you'll find around the building here if you want to have a look at them, and we've referenced a number of them in the book. That's not the purpose. All we want to show here is that the methodology has some fundamental differences from how projects are managed traditionally. So what? Well, 
What that means when it comes to focusing <coughs> project manager's attention. As a project manager, I want to know how my project is going. And are there any particular tasks that we need to help because they're starting to have some problems and issues? I do not want that problem to slowly grow into a great big significant problem. And that, for most project managers, is, is their biggest worry. That's what keeps them awake. Is that, are there any little problems that I'm not aware of? And if we're not careful, it turns us into micromanagers. And on a big project, we just can't be everywhere. And then we solve the problem by bringing in an army of, of helpers and spies to go around the project in detail and find out what's happening. Critical chain takes a slightly different approach by measuring what's happening in this buffer as the project goes on. Now, as we mentioned, these tasks have got at least a 50% chance of taking longer than the amount of time allowed from them. And that's fine. That's expected. And if this task takes a bit longer, all these are pushed a bit <coughs> further along, so we start to use some of this buffer up. And that's at the heart of the method of project control known as buffer management, another of the differences in project management. We're not using earned value, we're not using hitting deliverables and deadlines, we're primarily using a technique called buffer management. And basically, depending upon how far the project has progressed, we look at how much of this buffer has gone. And if we're halfway through the project progress, and the this task has been pushed up to here about halfway through, we're feeling reasonably comfortable. Halfway along, half the buffer's gone. If we've not made much progress and half the buffer's gone, we're starting to worry. If we're almost finished and none of the buffer's gone, we're quite happy. So that's the principle behind this project fever chart. In the literature, in the software that exists for critical chain, there are variations on the theme. I'm not going to argue the whys and wherefores of one or the other. I just kept the picture simple. Basically, it's indicating <coughs> how much of the project has been completed versus how much of that buffer has been used. And if we're using up much more buffer than progress, we should worry. Red. If we're using a lot less buffer than progress, green. As a project manager, I can be relaxed. And if it's somewhere in the middle, I might place a little bit of attention. What will we do if it gets worse? A really powerful method for focusing attention. A really powerful method for giving us an early warning of issues that at the moment, with almost every method of project control used in capital <coughs> and construction projects, we're relatively blind. If any of you are interested, we've got some great comparisons between using a fever chart and earn value management and how some issues that earn value management doesn't notice, a fever chart turns red weeks or months, or sometimes years before the uh, more traditionally accepted methods will indicate you've got anything like a problem. <coughs> now, one of the next extensions of this very simple fever chart model is it also gives us a way of looking at a programme of activities, a programme of projects, a portfolio of projects, and as a senior manager, the ability to look at eight projects in my company and with a single glance, which ones am I happy with, which ones should I put some time and attention to. And here, probably doesn't come up very clearly, yeah, project D. It's about 60% of the way through and it's used about 85% of the budget. It's not buffer. It's not got much contingency left. <coughs> It's got a lot of work still to do, so this is one that probably needs some support, some help to bring it back on schedule, bring it back on budget. This one, 85% finished, it's got lots of buffer left. I can probably leave that one well alone. So we can focus time and effort of management. Very powerful tool. I know of companies that have put in place software for managing through critical chain, purely triggered by senior management not knowing what's happening in the company. It's not been driven by project managers wanting to be better, it's senior executives wanting to know what's happening with the 50 or 100 projects happening concurrently in our business. 
So critical chain what project management. It's been proven for 20 odd years. IT com massive IT companies, massive companies introducing new products, from engineered products to pharmaceuticals, uh, new cars. As I mentioned Mazda just, just the other week uh, were thanking the methodology for helping them to turn their company around. They were equating the last three years of profitability to having got control and significantly improved their project management process. So it works, no doubt. Same project, earlier, on time, on budget, but. And you knew there had to be a but. Yeah, in this case, a big red but. Uh, the main obstacle to implementing critical chain in construction and capital projects is how we contract and purchase. These are the main obstacles. Because critical chain only works in a collaborative project team, it's a collaborative environment, that's what it needs. And most construction and capital projects do not put in place single teams. The contracts are inherently win-lose. If something goes wrong, the contracts require somebody to be at fault and somebody to take the financial impact. The whole idea of fixed prices for something that is indeterminate Nobody knows what's going to happen to the steel markets, how much steel, what ideas are going to be uh, going to come up, who I'm going to be working against. So in reality, nobody can know exactly how much something's going to cost or how long it's going to take. But we insist on deadlines and fixed prices. That by itself adds to the, the budgeted cost of a project and the budgeted duration. And then we manage it in a way that makes all that safety wasted and disappeared, so it's not even a reliable way. We don't even get the convenience of good projects on time by offloading risk and fixing prices. It just costs us more. And if anything, it adds to the risk, doesn't reduce the risk. That's my opinion. Now, critical chain requires the opposite. It needs a collaborative project team. This whole idea of a shared safety buffer it means your contractors don't know who's going to need it when they start on the project. And since a lot of their costs come with the amount of time they take, they don't know how much it will cost them either. So sharing the time buffer means also sharing the costing arrangements. Critical Chain has a philosophy known as Relay Runner, which means you run as fast on your bit until you can pass the baton to the next contractor in the chain, and they run to the next section. That is not how most projects run. There's a fixed deadline. Now, if you're going to be looking at the progress of the previous contractor and adapting your start date, with traditional contracts, you'd be issuing variation orders all the time. Oh, I'm now starting two days earlier. I'm now starting a day later. Would, wouldn't be worth it. But that's what we need to adapt and shift to. <coughs> My view is that the currently most common procurement and contracting methods just don't let you doing that. Whilst the client understands I want, I want this project to run as fast as possible, but I'm going to put you in chains and to stop you running very quickly. Yeah, it just makes no sense. Now, of course, people in chain can run and they can have a race. So putting all your contractors in chains and making them run slowly, you can still have a competitive bid you'll still get one of them who can run slightly faster than the other. But if you really want them to break world records, you have to cut the chains and get rid of them. And that comes to the, uh, the second area. Moving away from fixed prices, independent suppliers doing just their bit. No, we're talking about performance-related fees. We're talking about aligned incentives across the supply chain. We're talking about risk and uncertainty managed at the project level, not pushed down the work breakdown structure. Single team, same measures. Now, I mentioned fixed prices in passing. Fixed prices are great if I'm going shopping in the supermarket or if I'm buying some technology. But for something complicated, uncertain, like a $100 million 100 million euro investment in a new factory that I actually want as quick as possible 
To me, it makes no sense. It adds time to your project. It takes longer to assess. Most people working in the industry know that the bid price of a contractor is very rarely the outturn price of the project, but we use this bid price to select them. Lots and lots of uh, strange conflicting behaviours. But one of the worst is that that sort of conflicting adversarial environment, it's almost impossible to make critical chain work. So here's some research in the construction industry. There's lots of research on why collaborative supply relationships make for better <coughs> results. These, like critical chain, like the approach to collaborative <coughs> contracting I'm going to talk about, are over 20 years ago, 20 years old. The University of Texas researched about 100 or so construction projects in the US and discovered those that collaborate had more satisfied clients, more profitable contractors, whilst at the same time the cost went down. Well, cost goes down, supplies make more profit. Yes, it's possible. And it's faster. And it's safer. And it's got better quality. Now, I've seen no evidence that collaboration, when done well, adds to cost, adds to time, reduces quality. I've seen plenty of supportive collaborative evidence that it does the opposite. So as I was talking to uh, Philippe Maris earlier on this afternoon, I just don't understand why the industry hasn't taken hold of these ideas and implemented them, but it hasn't, which is why we wrote the book, because we found very few people even knew about them. We were just overcoming that hurdle. So we're going to look at an approach to project uh, to uh, project contracting known as a project alliance. Now, at a simple level, the traditional the traditional project, the client contracted with a major contractor to do the whole job, who brought in subcontractors who would often sub subcontract a hierarchical chain of command with a desire to try and put fixed prices into, into this chain. A project alliance looks somewhat different. It puts together a project team very early on amongst the main contractors, you know, representing 80, 85, 90% of the work that needs to be done. People who've sufficiently large to, to have some skin in the game, to have a strong influence over the success of the project. And they come together in a single contract. No one of them is the boss of the other one. They're all peers, whatever the size. They're all in the same team, in the same way that the goalkeeper, the defenders, the midfielders, the strikers in a football team. They're in one team. Now they ha might have different s salaries, different jobs, but they've got a single goal, win this football game. This team has a single goal make the project successful as defined by the client. In this model, it's quite easy for the client to be happy, these to be happy, these to make a loss, and these to make a loss. In the project alliance model, this team is either all happy together or all very sad together. There's no mechanism for one to financially win whilst the others can't. Uh, and that financial model is summarised on the next page. Without going into a great deal of detail, uh, under an alliance project, all those companies that are members of the alliance are paid in exactly the same way. I call it cost-fixed variable, as the three elements of the fee they get. The biggest one is the money they've spent. If they spend some money, they get reimbursed. No markup. No 5.6% added to it. If it's the salary of full-time staff, it's exactly their salary. If it's an invoice from a supplier or a subcontractor, it's exactly the invoice. The project costs what it'll cost. The two elements that are of more interest to the alliance partners are a fixed and a variable fee. The fixed fee can be zero. But it's fixed in euros or dollars or pounds at the beginning. It's not a percentage of this. So having more cost go through your books does not affect how much money you're paid. 
there is no need to fight over turnover. In fact, if you want to impress your boss with a good percentage return, you actually want less turnover, not more, in percentage terms. The idea is that once the project has started, the only mechanism to make more money for the supply partners is the variable fee. And that is fully linked to the success of the project. And it's for the client to decide whether that success is how much it costs, when it starts, how long a certain period lasts, what the quality is, whether the customers are happy, how safe it is. The first project alliance I did, 30% of my company's income and my partner, the other supply partners, 30% was how we managed safety on a, uh, on a uh, chemical industry construction project. We also had measures for how much it cost, how long it took, how long their plant was shut down, and they actually had a certain amount, which was the behaviours of the project team, on a very simple scale. If we behaved like a particular con an average contractor, we got this much. If we behaved like bad contractors, we got this much. And if we behave, if our staff, if the project team behaved as the client staff did, we got more. No, very simple. They do take some working out, but as soon as the project's underway, this is fixed. Can't do anything about it. This is just money straight through the company. So this is what I focus on as a project manager. And we're all in it together. So what that means is the structural and the groundwork contractor might have different amounts of target. One might have 200,000, another 100,000, but it either goes down to zero together or it goes up together and it, it really changes individuals behaviors aligned incentives and it's almost as simple as that but it's simple in concept not easy in practice because it's totally different to how people have worked for the past 50 60 years how they've been trained how they've been rewarded many people can do it they feel released many people find it very difficult so we do have to be careful about the teams we choose, the individuals we put on a project. But these are the sorts of differences. We select based on skill and competence now, not based on a number, not based on a fixed price bid. You've got to be comfortable sharing risk <coughs> with other, other, other companies, other suppliers and the client. Now you're in the same boat. You're all in this together. Who caused what to happen doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether the goalie kept his legs open or the defender missed a tackle or the forward gave a bad pass that was intercepted. If a goal's been scored, a goal's been scored. And then you just start again. It doesn't matter who's done what. That's, that, that, that's the whole mindset. For the client, it comes with the consequence that you can no longer dictate. Your supply chain's got skin in the game. That means they've got a right to have a voice. And you need to move to consensus decision-making, not client dictate. So it's not for everybody. But if you can marshal that, if you can get in the same boat, this is a cartoon from over 20 years ago when I was involved in project alliances, but it summarised the idea to me. This, th these are people who worked on traditional projects. Now, I'm glad the hole is at their end. Now, you're going to drown. And that's the whole spirit of a project alliance, putting things together. By the way, a project alliance can still be competitively bid. It's not about herding your mates into the room and cuddling them and saying, I know this guy, he's a good mate of mine. Things will work perfectly. No. You can still get competition, but based on skill, not a fixed price lump sum that everybody knows has been made up and the project won't cost that much and in the public sector as well as the private sector. It's not something that the public sector procurement rules will prevent. It does need some thinking because it's not the norm. So there's the, uh, there's the, the summary. Here's the end of uh, what I've been talking about. But if we can do it, we believe a faster, lower cost, better project can deliver that famous win-win. The client gets 
significantly higher return on investment. Their investment is lower and they get a working asset much sooner. The supplier can make more profit at lower cost. No longer do they have to increase their turnover to make more profit. And the drivers for that, collaborative selection and contracting and the use of a project alliance. Then you make sure your team works collaboratively. Then you use critical chain project management to, uh, to plan and manage your project. That's our recipe. You can read about it more in the book. Uh, I look forward to hearing your tales of how it goes. Thank you for your time and effort.